In this video I'll be building the latest Talking Electronics Z80 computer. If you were a teenager in the 80s, you're probably watching this video. You would also be familiar with popular 8-bit computers like the Commodore 64, Apple II and the Amstrad CPC range. Considering their success, others wanted to get into the market. Instead of doing the hard work of creating a new computer, some just opted to reverse engineer or clone an existing computer. Some famous clones are the Laser 128 and the Timex Sinclair. But did you know the little known Talking Electronics computer was also copied? The tech was developed in 1983 by John Hardy and Ken Stone. It is a single board Z80 computer with easy to find parts and a simple design. It was very popular. Around 1990, a guy called Peter Crowcroft joined Talking Electronics to help the company expand overseas. He learned all he could about the business and then left and started his own company in Hong Kong called Kits R Us. He then hired an electronic engineer called Craig Jones. Craig worked at Talking Electronics a few years earlier. Peter commissioned Craig to build a Z80 single board computer. They developed the Southern Cross computer, which had a similar design to the tech, but had enough modern changes to be a bit different. The ROM that came with the Southern Cross was rewritten, but still contained some of the original tech code. And there it was, on the front cover of the August 1993 Silicon Chip magazine. It was strikingly similar to the Talking Electronics computer. It had the same add-ons, and even the instruction manuals were very similar. Fast forward almost 30 years, Craig Jones comes into the Talking Electronics computer scene, and is welcomed as the original designers of the tech have moved on with the politics of Talking Electronics. He then reconnects with Colin Mitchell, the founder of Talking Electronics, to create a new version of the tech computer, the Tech 1F. Craig goes from cloner villain to a tech hero. Craig and a few others now lead the way with tech projects, including the Talking Electronics computer first programming language, Mint, a stack-based, fourth-inspired language. So here is the latest Talking Electronics computer, the Tech 1F. It is designed by Craig Jones. And it actually looks quite similar to the original board built in the mid-80s. But there are some differences that have modernized the board. Firstly, being a single board computer, it has a keyboard over here. The keyboard has now options to choose between a small or a large tactile switch. And over here are the outputs, seven segment displays. You have the address and the data, although you can display whatever you like on those outputs. There's also a speaker. The new board finally has an on and off switch. Over the top here we have the Z80 CPU, the ROM and RAM, and an expansion port which mostly has the address and data lines. Over in this corner is the clock. The original came with a CMOS style clock that could be changed with this variable resistor. Also inbuilt now is a crystal oscillator and you can switch between both of them. There's been an improvement on the memory or the size of memory. Originally it was 2Ks. This can now be expanded to 8Ks, and I'm going to love that. I don't need some crazy 2K expansion board. And this memory can be selected by jumpers over here, and also a switch over here which can choose between an upper or lower ROM. One of the new features is having connections to serial communication. This is something valuable for modern day computing, where you can easily type in the code through on your computer compile it and send it directly to the Z80 single board computer. The output is driven by the spare output port and the input goes directly into the keyboard input on bit number seven. The original board was one-sided. This board is two-sided which saves you wiring the links and plus the connections on the top are also labeled. So if you do need to get to the ground pin, well there's ground here. If you do need to get to some of the data lines where you can just connect directly through here. The design of this is quite nice. Links on the top side of the board are vertical and if I flip the board over you have a nice horizontal lines connecting the, the memory chips and the data bus. It is quite a neat board and it also thanks the original designers John Hardy and Ken Stone. 
This video is sponsored by NextPCB. NextPCB is a reliable multi-layer PC board manufacturer, making high quality printed circuit boards for all your electronic needs. NextPCB offers totally free prototype PC boards for one to four layers. That's right, it'll cost you nothing for the board. And it's really easy to order. Just go to their website, click learn more, click instant quote, then just simply upload the Gerber file. Select the zip file, open it. Once the board is loaded, everything is pre-filled. Select how many boards you want, and it will cost zero dollars. And even better, when you sign up, you customers get a hundred dollars coupon for free. So for your next PC board project, use NextPCB. They produce high quality boards at a fast 24 hour turnaround time. Just click on the link below in the description to order your next PC board. Let's now look at the design of the Tech 1F and it is a really simple design. Firstly, you have the Z80 chip, which has a clock which keeps it ticking. Then there are two memory chips, ROM and RAM. They are connected together to the data and address bus. How do we select the ROM and RAM? Only one can be used at one time. We have a memory decoder, which is triggered by the memory request line and also the high address bits of the CPU. For output, it's really basic. We have a six, seven segments displays displaying the address and data or whatever else you want to display there and a speaker. They are all connected together via an IO decoder and that uses the IO request line to activate it. For input, we have a keyboard, a hex keyboard, which gives you the ability to enter hex values into memory locations and also use a plus or minus to increase or decrease the current address that you're looking at, an address button to modify the location of the address and a go button to execute the code at the current address location. How is the keyboard connected? Again, through the IO decoder. But one interesting thing here is it's connected to the non-maskable interrupt line of the CPU which is an interesting design choice. And for expansion, there's another expansion socket to connect a bit more memory, RAM or ROM, and also some extra spare IO decoders to add extra input or output devices. How is the memory decoded? Well, for the 2K option, it's in 2K chunks. Each 2K chunk is 800 hex. So ROM, RAM expansion and then there's spare addresses. For the AK option, it actually uses the whole address space. And for IO decoding, port zero is connected to the keyboard, that's an input. Port one and port two are outputs. One of the ports turns the segments on and off individually, and the other port, port two, outputs what LED segments on a particular segment to be on or off. And three and seven are just spare. For all the information you need to build the Tech One F, just go to Craig Jones's GitHub page under Tech One. You'll find a Tech One F directory, and inside there it has all the parts you need, the schematic, and other information for the build. He also has two monitors, which are the EEPROM code to get the tech working. CMON is a modified version of the Southern Cross monitor for the Tech One F, and JMON is the latest. Tech One F monitor and probably the most advanced. Here are some of the tools that I'll be using to construct the board. I have the solder, my soldering iron here. It's not an expensive soldering iron, but I'll make sure the tip is clean. I have some tweezers. It does help um, picking little parts up and bending legs when needed on components. Some pliers to uh, cut the ends of the legs of the components off. I've got this nice little resistor folding template, really cheap to get. This is just a 3D printed bit of plastic. I have some solder here. Now this solder I've had since I was a teenager. You notice it's a Dick Smith brand, pretty hard to get nowadays. Still got a bit of it left. And if things go really bad, I've got some desoldering wick. But over here I have this device, which I've only attained recently, but I've found it really invaluable to work out what value of the component that I'm looking at. 
looking at a resistor here, it's sometimes hard to see what the bands are. Well, this tester makes it a lot easier. And it's a, a bit easier than using a multimeter. So I just bend the legs. I can just put in this template here, bend the legs around, turn the device on, put the resistor in, in the socket here, make sure it's two different connections, close it, press start for the testing, and it tells me it's a 47 kilo ohm resistor. It also tests capacitors, diodes, transistors. I think it only costs me about $20, so a very valuable tool to use. Another unique thing about this board, is it is a single board computer. It has everything on here that you need to learn Z80 assembler or Z80 programming. So if you really want to learn Z80 with something physical here, this is the computer to get. So I believe I have all the parts ready to go. This project has been on the shelf for a bit. I'm looking forward to building it. So let's now put it together. Most of the components on the board are labelled with their values, like the capacitor here, 100 nanofarads, but some are just C10, C9, R20, R19. You can find the corresponding values in the parts list on the GitHub page. Or even better, work it out yourself by looking at the schematic and using a multimeter on the board to see where all the tracks go. R19 is a 560 ohm resistor. Let's put that in now. With the diodes, make sure the bands are in the right position. Match the white bands on the diodes to the white bands on the board. All right, I've got the resistors in. Look how neat these resistors are using my leg bending tool. Next, let's put in the integrated circuit sockets. Well, that was a lot of soldering, but sockets are done. I've left the ROM, so I can put one of these zero insertion force sockets and the expansion port, well, we'll leave that for later. Haven't worked out exactly what I'll do with that yet. And I did have the wrong socket size for the RAM, but cut it down to size, no worries. Now next build choice are these seven segment displays. I can put the seven segments in and just solder them in directly, but these are seven LEDs and a dot, what happens if one of these don't work? Well, I've got to pull out the whole seven segment. Now that's a pain if you don't have really good desoldering tools. But what I am going to do is I've got some spare 40 pin sockets and they actually fit perfectly in the footprint of the seven segments. So I'm going to put a couple of these sockets in so I can easily replace these seven segment displays if they do play up. All right, so with some flat nose pliers, I was able to push the pins out that I didn't want. And these uh, two sockets fit perfectly well into the, into the board. Now I have got some parts of the socket hanging out of the side over here and in the gap over there. But I think when the seven segments are in the board, you won't even notice. And thanks to Mark Jellick of the uh, tech group who suggested this idea. With all the low profile parts in, I've still got two more to go, so it's probably a good time to put the crystal oscillator in and the variable resistor. They suggest using a 4 MHz crystal. You can use uh, other crystals if you like, but 4 MHz does divide well 
if you're going to transfer data from the tech to the computer using a smaller board rate. This part goes in here, it's kind of like undocumented on the board, but that's where the crystal oscillator goes. And the 20k variable resistor just slots up here. Next I need to decide what to do with these selectors here for the 2K and 8K ROM RAM, crystal oscillator or CMOS clock, and the A11 switch here to select the upper or lower ROM. So I could use header pins with a jumper, but what I've decided to, to do is use just a simple micro switch. And it just makes it easier to switch between them, and also I have a heap of them. All right, as you can see, I've got the micro switches in. Now let's put the transistors and capacitors in. Have a look at the uh, transistors here. These are BC547 transistors, really easy to find. They're used primarily to turn on and off the seven second displays and the speaker. It's important to put these transistors in the correct orientation in the board. As you can see, a flat side of their transistor here that matches to the flat side of the transistor on the PC board. So it will be like so. Now it's time to put the LEDs in. There's one for the speaker, showing that the speaker is on, and also one for the power. I always like to test my LEDs, make sure they're working beforehand, normally connecting up to a simple circuit, but this tester works really well. Let's plug it into the tester. Turn it on. And I can see it flashing, it does work, and it also shows me the voltage drop. Excellent. The next design choice is what type of button I should use for the keypad. As you can see, there's two different footprint layouts for a small or a larger style tactile switch. And here is a large tactile switch that I could use. It goes well with a nice little cap on top and sits nicely into the board. Another choice I can use is a smaller style tactile switch. See here. These are okay, but you do get sore fingers pressing these little buttons all the time. I have got caps, a little, you can see that, a little rubber cap that you can put on top, but still, uh, the switches that I've got, the cap doesn't fit that well. But I think the best solution is this style of tactile switch. It's a smaller footprint tactile switch with a slightly different button. What you can do is put the cap on the top of the switch, like so, and then you can place whatever lettering or numbering on top of that switch to indicate what the button represents and then put a clear cap on top to protect it. So not only you've got the indicator of what the switch is on top, but also a nice feel to it. And again, thanks to Mark Yellick for suggesting this type of switch.
Well, that's the buttons installed, and they look really good, and they also feel really nice. Okay, almost there now, just finalizing with the last large components. I have uh, the ZIF socket, screw terminal, the power regulator that fits under the board, and some switches. With the switches, I initially got one of these lever switches, but I did notice that uh, it is too wide for the, the holes on the board, and it kind of sticks out a bit, so I decided to go with one of these slide switches here although I had to cut some of the legs off that I'm not going to use but still also it doesn't fit properly into these holes I'm not sure of the footprint whether it's an issue here anyway I'll file that down and get that in and whoops don't forget the speaker Just a reminder, when putting the ICs in, there has been a correction. The 74HC374 connected to the keyboard chip should be a 74HC373 chip. There's been some issues with the serial transmission and how these uh, latches are triggered on the leading edge of the signal. And I don't know if you know, but these ICs always have these legs splayed out. And if someone can tell me a better way to flatten them instead of putting them on a table, let me know. I've tried to get one of those squeezy devices, but I just can't find one anywhere. All right, this is it. I've finally assembled the board. Got my power supply connected to it. I've got two monitors on this 8K ROM, but I'm only using the 2K address space. Now let's turn it on. This monitor code, or you can say the operating system, starts at address 900 hex, and at location 900 hex is A8. I can then type away, say 3E, it updates, press plus, go to the next memory location, minus goes back. So I guess now what can you do with this computer? Well, you can actually type in Z80 machine code and get the Z80 processor doing what you want it to do. At the moment, we only have outputs on the seven segment displays. There are expansion boards, which you can connect an LCD to, or an eight by eight LED matrix, or a variety of other things. You can access other ports via here, this spot in the board over here, to then turn on and off whatever you like, motors, relays. Just some things that I noticed when getting this thing fired up, it has provision for 2K or 8K EEPROMs and RAM, but it's really wired up properly for an 8K EEPROM. They're more commonly found. The 4K ones like this do work, but pin 24, the power pin, is connected to pin 26 on the board here, but that's not connected to anything. So if you want to use an existing 4K EEPROM from maybe your original tech computer, you'll need to wire pin 26 to power. And I've done that by just assembling a little switch up here, which connects that pin to a power or not connected. All right, to see if the computer is working properly, let's type in a simple program that will just output some characters to the screen here, to the seven segments. This program simply turns on one of the segments and displays some information. It just uses a simple lookup table with two pairs of data, one for the segment to light up and the other item which segments to light up on that segment. Let's now type that in. about 43 hex bytes keyed in. It wasn't too bad, it only took me a few minutes. 
Let's now run it. I'll reset the computer to go to the start address 900 and press go. So yeah, character flying around and ready Z80. Well, I couldn't get a Y or a Z, but it's read 80. Close enough. I've got the crystal oscillator here. Let's flick this to four megahertz. Okay, much faster there. And I can flick back, which is pretty cool. All right. To actually update the address, you can press the address button and type in an address. O A zero zero and address again. Changing ROMs is easy. If you've got a 2K ROM here, you've got the lower half and the upper half both on this chip. You can just flick the low and high switch. So hold reset down, flick it low. And now I've got one of the original monitors, monitor one. This monitor starts at 800 hex and it's actually got some programs on here. So D7 is a restart command. I hit go and I got this little game here called NIM, NIM. I've got to pick up matches, 17 left. I'll pick up three now, 13. I'm playing against the computer here, two. I think I'm going to lose, two. And the last one to pick up the match loses. Well, that's me. You lose. Stupid. So I'd like to thank everyone for watching this build. It's been really enjoyable. Finally got my hands on the latest Z80 tech computer. In the upcoming videos, I will be creating a fully operational 8K ROM with an expansion board, which will include an LCD and an 8x8 LED matrix, plus the ability to add more RAM on. It's going to take me probably a while to get that running, so be patient. I might have other videos in between. So do yourself a favor. If you want to learn Z80 and have this pretty impressive showpiece of a computer, go and purchase one of these from Craig Jones. I've got all the links provided and everything else you need to know about this computer and all the code. And remember, for your next PC board at $0, order them from NextPCB. Just click on the link in the description below. So I'll just like to finish on one of the tunes. This tune was pre-programmed into the ROM by John Hardy. You just use a restart command EF and here it is. And in turbo mode. Thanks for watching again and see you next time.